the Center for Critical Thinking and Moral Critique, in concert with Sonoma State University, is proud to present videotape proceedings of the International Conference on Critical Thinking and Educational Reform. So as you know, this is part of a series, and up to this point in time, we've covered the following topics. How to teach your students to seek the logic of things. How to teach your students to listen and read well. How to teach your students to write well. And now we're working on two parts, one part of which we've already completed. How to teach your students to assess their own work, the foundations, and in this session, how to teach your students to assess their own work, the tactics. In the session on the foundations, let me give you, put a video um, overhead up here. I began with this diagram, and I've begun a number of programs with it, because it helps to tie sort of the ultimate foundations together and lead us into the specific nature of this topic. What this diagram implies is that whenever you're teaching, there are three major variables. Of course, we're making some assumptions. You'll notice those as I proceed. First is the logic of reasoning, and by that, I mean the, gen the logic of reasoning in general, what it is to reason, what's involved in reasoning. And one of the metaphors I developed in the last session had to do with the fact that if you're in a class on ballet or a class on basketball or in a class on carpentry, you'd never think to try to do it in such a way that the student didn't realize that they were doing ballet or didn't realize that they were playing basketball. In fact, when you try to conceive such a class with the students not realizing these things, you see that it would be virtually impossible. And yet, we say in our classes we're fostering reasoning, and most of the students don't know that this is what is going on there. That is, very often we don't talk about their reasoning as reasoning. We don't talk about reasoning very often. We don't talk about the parts of reasoning the standards used to assess reasoning. And so it becomes, in a way, questionable as to whether, in fact, we are really committed to teaching reasoning. And so in the last session, I tried to make the case for the fact that if reasoning is essential, and it is, then we have to be pretty much as explicit about the fact that reasoning is involved as we would be if it was basketball or ballet or tennis. Secondly, the second variable is the logic of the content. It's not enough to know what reasoning is about in general and about what the various parts of reasoning are, the things that make it up. It's not enough to know the general standards of reasoning and some of the basic abilities that are involved. One must also, as an instructor, master or at least deeply understand the logic of the content one is teaching. And I talked at some length, but I will only mention briefly here, the fact that when somebody says, I have too much content to cover to focus very much on thinking, I'd like to do more time with thinking, but I've got to make sure that the students get this content that such a person does not, in fact, understand the logic of the content they teach. 
and they couldn't understand the logic of the content they teach and say that because content has a logic such that it can be learned only through thinking. Content, what we call content, is a product of a mind, it's not a natural reality, and it is produced by thinking. It is discovered by thinking, it is applied by thinking, it is comprehended by thinking, it is analyzed by thinking, it is synthesized and organized by thinking, and it is assessed by thinking. And when you take the thinking out of it, it doesn't exist. You can't take thinking out of content. There is nothing left once the thinking is gone. And I mentioned, of course, a very trivial way in which students could get some content without thinking. And this is the way in which a tape recorder gets content. Simply by recording what it doesn't comprehend and parroting that back. But as I also said, the tape recorder of the student's mind self-erases much quicker than the tape in a tape recorder decays. And the value of the student functioning as tape recorder is extremely low, and certainly is no interesting sense of their getting the content even temporarily. To put it another way, knowledge is not something that can be given. It's not something that can be memorized. It's something that is constructed and only under certain conditions. There are conditions in which there is a significant involvement of the mind in the construction process. The third variable is the logic of the student's thinking. By understanding the logic of content, we know that reasoning is essential to it. But the third variable is that the student brings to the class certain preformed concepts, assumptions, patterns of inference, values, traits, attitudes, habits. And all of these mental phenomena are a product of and intimately pervaded by student thinking. Since we cannot inject the logic of reasoning into student minds, nor inject the logic of the content in the student's mind, since thinking is what must be used to acquire that content, and since we cannot give the students our thinking any more than we can give them the content, we must use our knowledge of the logic of the student's thinking as the only tool we have available for them to understand both the logic of reasoning and the logic of the content, and why they have to reason through the content to get the content. So there are three fundamental logics that we have to understand as teachers and professors. And it's understanding the interrelationship between these three that defines the logic of teaching. You can't just work with one of these variables. It doesn't matter how well you know the logic of the content. It doesn't matter how well you abstractly understand what reasoning is. You must understand how students think, and you must be able to cultivate that. If this is true, then how are we to understand what and who we are as a teacher? It seems to me that the fundamental thing that we have to understand as teachers is that we are essentially coaches. You might say, we should say, I'm the coach of the anthropological reasoning team. What do you coach? I coach economic reasoning from 1800 to 1900. I can, uh, I'm the coach of the Steinbeck reasoning team. I coach reasoning about the novel of Steinbeck's and learning to think as Steinbeck thought and learning to see how you think in relationship to the way Steinbeck thought. This is the way we might talk if we saw the full logic of what we were about. There is an old Eastern saying that I think is very relevant here, and it is this. You can't make a flower grow by pulling on it. <laughs> and teaching 
to say, switch the metaphor to gardening for a moment, is like the process of helping a plant to grow. The plant has its own logic inherent in it, and we realize that we have to work outside, cultivate, dig around the plant, water, bring in sunlight, protect it in various ways in order for the plant to grow out of itself. And so we're part gardener, part coach, and all coaches are good at cultivating in a certain way. And just as things can go wrong with a plant because the gardener didn't take into account its fragility, the nature of how it can grow, so things can go wrong in the classroom because we're either too tough or not good enough of a coach or don't recognize we're a coach at all, or because we pull on the plant, or because we expect too much of the plant. Uh, and let me add one further word here, the word education. Most of you know, I'm sure, that the roots of the word come from two Latin words, meaning to lead out, to draw out. There's a very interesting contrast between the logic of the word education and the logic of the word indoctrination. Do indoctrination is teaching put in. Education is something drawn out. And so the word education really has the metaphor for this process of cultivating reasoning. And indoctrination has a logic that is not conducive to education because it is simply doctrine in, and I think it's doctrine in in the way, a way parallel to the way uh, we often train our animals with reward and punishment to get them to respond in the way that we want them to respond. When one is indoctrinated, they don't understand the very doctrine which they have received. They can't analyze it, they can't apply it with insight, they can't reason within it. They understand certain, they have allegiance to words without fully realizing what the words mean. So how can we, how can we go about the process? It seems to me each of these four statements are important. One, a good coach takes the understandings and the skills of the team seriously. Now let me give you an example. One of my students, who was quite a good student in critical thinking, very motivated to learn how to think critically, recognizing that he wanted to reason in each of the subjects that he took, took a basic requirement at this university in American history. And because he realized a little bit about the logic of history, namely that the same period could be reconstructed by different historians in a somewhat different way. He read a book, which I recommended to him, that took a different approach to American history than the one that the textbook of the class was taking. And this stimulated, along with the lectures, many, many questions. So he started to raise his hand in class and ask the questions. After the class, the after a couple of classes, the instructor took him aside and said, these are fine questions, but don't ask them in class because I can't cover the material if you ask them. And the interesting thing was, he said that none of the other students were asking questions. And the instructor didn't see the asking of questions as relevant to learning the material. And now, I can see under one condition how this might be true. If the students in the class were critical listeners already, and they silently dialogued with the lecturer as it went on, and put the questions into their notes, and followed up the questions later on their own, then I would grant you that might be a model that was acceptable. But I think the fact of the matter was that the professor didn't think he was a coach of historical reasoning. I think he thought he was a fountainhead of historical fact and information and knowledge. And I think that unconsciously he believed that you could give people knowledge 
and that that's what he was doing. And so I think what we've got to do is realize that if reasoning is what I've suggested it is, then what we have to do is take seriously the notion that when we're teaching, we have to be paying attention to the understandings and skills of our students and helping them to use reason to acquire these. You see, the kinds of skills and performances that we cultivate in education presuppose understandings. That is, they are not simply motor skills. Motor skills may be involved, but only partially. It's always motor skills in connection to certain understandings. I remember a story once of the plumber who comes and uh, goes down, looks at the pipe, studies them for a moment, takes out his hammer, pounds on a pipe, and says, that'll be $50.50. And the person says, for pounding on a pipe? That doesn't seem justifiable. And the plumber says, OK, understand it this way. 50 cents for pounding on the pipe, and $50 for knowing where to pound. <laughs> so that there's the motor side of it, but there's understanding where and when and how to do that. The understanding side is very significant. So we need those understandings, and then we have to figure out, in understanding the logic of our subject, what, do, what sorts of understandings do the students need in order to develop the skills and abilities that historical reasoning, mathematical reasoning, biological reasoning, physiological reasoning, anthropological reasoning, and so forth require. Secondly, we have to arrange discipline practice. Here are, here's the attitude of students when they come into my critical thinking class. Something like this. I would like to learn some critical thinking, and I might even practice once during the semester. But basically, I'd like you to lecture me into critical thinking. Now, I tell my students, if you were going out for the basketball team, how far do you think you'd get? How seriously would you be taken if you said, I'll practice once during the semester? You wouldn't be taken seriously. Because to become good at basketball, you have to practice. And you have to practice with some motivation. You have to take into account the nature of the game, what you're trying to achieve. You've got to interest yourself in the parts, the little skills that go along with it. Basketball players practice stroking the ball. They practice squaring themselves to the basket. They practice free throws. They practice guarding. OK. I'm going to attack you in an argument. I want you to guard yourself. Don't let me take the ball away from you. Let's practice that. If you give up on the first time I knock the ball out of your hands, how far would you get in basketball with that attitude? Do You see, I think that one of the ways into the mind is by, and, and this has to do, again, with the logic of student thinking, they already accept what they, when it has to do with the body, and its development, what they need to accept when it comes to do with the mind. But they see no correlation between body and mind. The Romans had a saying, main sano in corpore sano, a sound mind in a sound body. We live in the age of physical fitness. You see people everywhere taking the fitness of their body seriously. But you don't see people taking the fitness of their mind seriously. The reason is, quite briefly, you can stand before a mirror in the nude and get a sense of the fitness of your body. But the mirror for the mind is the mind itself. And the undeveloped mind sees itself as fit to the degree that it is unfit. And so to the degree that somebody has a mind that is undisciplined, they see no problem with their mind. And this is why it is so difficult to make intelligible to people that there is such a thing as a fit mind, and that developing a fit mind requires some kind of discipline 
that is in a broad sense parallel to the fitness on the uh, physical side of things. Thirdly, we have to discuss what is being practiced. You can't learn something if you don't know what you're practicing, if you don't know the purpose of it, you don't know why you're doing it, you don't know what the standards are, you don't know why the standards are being used. If you're just being told to do something and you do it but you don't really get it, then we're not going to go very far. So there has to be that discussion, and the discussion cannot simply be what you tell them. You have to see whether they get it. You have to see whether they understand it. And then fourthly, we have to arrange the games. The team must play. The performance must go on. And this performance must be a performance of reasoning. So we need mathematical reasoning and so forth. Here is a technique which is being used now in about 10% of the Japanese elementary school math classes. The class is divided into groups of four. The groups of four are now the teams on this model. And a problem is given to the class. Each group of four works on the problem, sees how quickly they can solve it or if they can solve it. The first group to solve it raises their hands, they're recognized, and they explain to the class how they solved it, and the class judges whether they did solve it or they didn't solve it. If they solved it, then the instructor gives them another problem, and they work on it. Now let me compare this for a moment. This happens again and again and again. And what the students start to do is think in this way. I think this problem is like the one we had a couple of weeks ago. Do you remember? This is the way we approached it. First we did this, and then we did this for this reason. Now, isn't this the same? No, no, no. I think this is more like the problem we had three weeks, four weeks ago. Remember that problem was a problem that we use this strategy. So they start to talk mathematical strategies. They start to develop mathematical tactics. They start to make mathematical moves and mathematical counter moves. This is mathematical reasoning. This is what mathematicians do. And they start to do that from the beginning. Now compare this to the standard way of teaching math. Here it is. Here is an algorithm or formula. Here's basically what it means. Here are some standard problems, and here's how you work the way through. If you get a problem like this, this is where you plug in this, this is where you plug in that, and this is how you get your answer. OK, now take this problem, which is quite like the problems I just did on the board, and each of you work one. OK? Now, did you get the correct answer? Here was the answer. Let me show you how you would have gotten it. A little more practice, now I give you a quiz. OK, now here's another formula. Here's the formula. Here's the standard problem, basic one, and so, so it goes. This is the pattern from elementary school to college in math instruction, this latter problem. All right, now Schoenfeld points out that you take elementary school children and you give them this question. There are 75 sheep in the field and five sheepdogs, how old is the shepherd? Four out of five, add, subtract, multiply, or divide to compute the age of the shepherd. And as Schoenfeld points out, the more math they've had, the greater the tendency. And he gives many other examples at different levels. His point is this, we're not teaching students to reason or think mathematically. He concludes, that mathematical instruction today has two characteristics. These are his words, not mine. One, deceptive. Two, fraudulent. That is, this is not what math is about. Once you have the formula and you know how to plug it in, the math is over with. That's not mathematical thinking anymore. So we're not practicing, according to him, mathematical thinking, mathematical reasoning. Compare it with that Japanese model in which the students are arguing mathematically, up and back. And this is why Schoenfeld says, what, we, what you need in the math class is math argumentation, not simply practicing moves on a pre-digested formula. OK, so we need the games. Let the games begin. Time for the competition. Who, of course, we have to watch out, because what we want the competition to be is not competition of student against student, but students against a standard. That is, we want criterion referenced, 
not norm reference, not who are the best, who are the worst, but let's see how well we can reach this level and this level and this level of ability. If you haven't gotten to this ability yet, nevertheless you're doing very good here, fine, keep working on it. So we're aiming at, so we might conceivably have all A's in the class, or all D's in the class, because we're not setting student against student, we're working to develop certain abilities. And need I say that however we do this, there should be no relationship between grades given and our attitude toward the dignity of the individual student who gets the grades. We should not assume that we like the people who get A's or dislike the people who get F's, and there should be no connection between how we individually feel about particular individuals and the grades they get. Presently, of course, students think that the reverse is true and that if you get a good grade, they like them. If you give a bad grade, they don't like them, and you're responding to them as a person in giving them a grade. Okay, so if we accept this model, then, how are we to proceed? What more specific things are we to do? Let me talk in general about the overall model, and then I'll, give, I'll get into very specific tactics. First of all, let's say we have the four variables here of what you can be teaching for, and that is understandings, skills, performances, and traits. And here's how they connect up, and they connect up in every area. Ultimately, what you want are performances, skilled performances, that is, good historical writing, good historical reading, good historical listening, good historical speaking, good historical reasoning, or whatever the kind of reasoning it is that you need to cultivate in the domain that you're teaching. So we want the performance, but the performance presupposes requires some skills. And so we have to pay attention to some of those skills, analogy, and the tennis uh, follow through. Follow through on the same plane, don't whip your arms straight up in the air, you won't have any leverage. Are your feet distributed? Let's practice distributing your weight. Let's practice returning to the ready position. Okay, that's the skill. The performance is out on the court. Now, I used to play tennis, and I was very good at the component skills at the backboard. But it was only when the skills had to be put in performance that my ability dipped significantly. So I had a beautiful backhand against the boards and a weak backhand on the court. I couldn't quite get from the skills as individual things to a seamless performance. And of course, this says that the performance is not just a sum of atomic skills. There's more to it than that. So we don't just practice skills and then expect somehow the performance is going to take care of itself. In fact, we do the performance, we have the game, then we analyze the performance and find out what skills we need to practice more. Just as the basketball teams, the coach comes in and says, okay, three hours of free throws for every single one of you until you finish, because our percentage on free throws was disgusting, no reason for that in the world. We need some more practice on that and so forth. I'm not saying that you as the coach of anthropological reasoning should come in and say exactly that, but coaches say that in sports and the team accepts it. They realize, yeah, coach, you're right. Terrible, terrible. We need to practice that more. All right, now understandings and traits are necessary in appreciating the skills, appreciating the performances, and carrying out the performances. So we have to decide, for example, for any segment of instruction, are we aiming fundamentally at understandings, laying the foundation for performance? Are we focusing on particular skills? Or are we giving the students an opportunity to perform? Or are we trying to cultivate a trait, which is, of course, the hardest thing of all to do, 
because that defines who we are. Let me give you the overall model as I see it. We've, we've delineated four different patterns of instruction, one for teaching for understandings, one for teaching for skills, one for teaching for performance, one for teaching for traits. And it's interesting to see their differences, but I want to emphasize their common denominator. They all begin with what I call the hook. And the hook, fishing model, is hook them into it. Get their reasoning going. You might be teaching um, 20th century American history, and you may take a recent event that you know the students are concerned with and get them thinking about that and hook them into it through that. That's what I mean by the hook. It must start their thinking. And so you might come into the class, and what you do might be the equivalent of the engine, mm, 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 but not mm. OK? So you keep trying to get it started, but it's not until it get, actually gets started that you're on your way. Sometimes I use this metaphor. I think of myself as priming the pump. You know, you put the water in and you pump, but no water comes up. You put some more water in and you pump some more and no water comes up. And so you prime, you prime, you prime, until finally some water comes up. Then you try to keep it going. Or you fan the flames, you know, and you work with the sparks. All of these metaphors, I think, shed light on that crucial part of every area of instruction where the thinking has got to get started. And until it gets started, nothing else can happen. Until you hook them, now you can't hook all of them or not all of them perfectly, but you better be hooking most of them. Otherwise, most of them are not getting anything out of it. All right, now once you hook them, another thing to aim at is whenever possible, model what you want. Model what you want. Be an example. I mean, if you, you were a basketball player yourself and you're coaching, you can get out on the floor with the team and show them the, new, the move you want, why they're not making it. And you can do it and let them try it, and you do it again and have them watch you, as dance instructors do and so forth. That's much better than if you tell them abstractly, but they don't see you doing it. For example, let me get down to specifics here, because we need models. Save strong papers, weak papers, mediocre papers. Remove the grades. Leave the commentary. Put them on reserve in the library or make them available st to students so they can see what does a strong performance look like? What does a weak performance look like? What does a mediocre performance look like? And when you do this, you get better work. Inevitably, whenever I'm able to do this, I get better performance. Because the students want to see, they want to know what's expected of them. Somehow it's very hard to imagine it unless you've seen it, seen the reality. Uh, so you can model it yourself, display it in front of them. You want them, for example, to read the text critically. They don't know what that means. They haven't the foggiest idea what that means. So you say, OK, open your books to chapter one, page one. I'm going to read the first paragraph aloud. And I'm in a dialogue with the text as I read. That's what I mean by critical reading. And you do that, and you say, Frank, take the next paragraph, read it aloud in front of the class, dialogue with the text as, as well as you can, following the model. Frank finishes, and you say, OK, I'll go back and read the same paragraph that Frank read, and I'll dialogue with him. You can see Frank's dialoguing and mine next to each other. All right. Now, Judy, you take over. You take the next paragraph. And then after a while, you put them in groups of threes. And you say, A, B, C, A, B, C, A person uh, reads B and, and then dialogues with that segment of the text. Then B and C add what you would have said. Then I take that same section and I read it. I do it, they do it, I do it, they do it, they do it, someone else does it. You keep them going up and back, model, model, practice, model, practice, model, model, practice, and so forth. Whenever possible, very important strategy and tactic to use. Now you say, that's what I mean when I say read the text. And then, of course, you have to hold them responsible 
for that. You have to check up to make sure that that's the way it's being done. And one of the most important strategies for doing this in many areas is based on the following concept, random sample. You don't have to check everything all the time. You just have to unexpectedly check sufficient number of times so they don't know when you're going to do it or how you're doing, and so they can't say, OK, you're going to grade this, but you're not going to grade that, so I'm not going to put any energy into this. I'm going to put my energy into that. And of course, you have to follow this up with their own assessment of the other things. So I might very well have eight papers assigned, and I might grade one of them and multiply by eight. Uh, it doesn't mean they don't get assessment on the other papers, because we're doing that in groups, and they're getting assessment. And I always allow a student to challenge an assessment by turning their paper into me and getting my assessment uh, if they want. But by working with the students on assessment, they get better and better at it. And so I find uh, I can develop the student's assessment ability to a significant degree by these strategies. And let me link this into critical thinking now. Critical thinking is thinking that assesses itself. And so if the students are not assessing themselves and do not know how to assess themselves, they are not thinking critically, period. Reasoning is the kind of thinking that does assess itself. So if students say, OK, here's my performance, but it may be an A, it may be an F. As I've said in others of this series, then it's an F. Because if you don't understand what you're trying to do or how to measure what you're trying to do, you don't know what you're trying to do. And you'll never be able to do it. You couldn't have a ballet dancer who didn't know what he or she was trying to achieve in a ballet move or a ballet performance. And so there's absolutely no reason why the mind should be any different. So we want modeling. Then we want designed performance. And here again, we want performance that you design, we want performance that they design. Because, of course, they have to learn to design their own performance. But first, you have to design what the performance is going to be. Again, what kind of reasoned performance is what people in the field do when they're out doing it? In assessment, there are two words that are exerting a tremendous amount of influence among assessing experts. One is the word authentic, and the other is the word performance. Multiple choice tests are being valued less and less because they're not performances and they're often not authentic. That is, they often have no relationship between what you have to do when you get out in the real world to do the sorts of things that education is supposed to help you to do. And more and more advanced testing groups are trying to come up with authentic performances. What do historians do? What do scientists do? What do mathematicians do? Well, I'll give you the answer. They reason historically. They reason mathematically. They reason economically and anthropologically and psychologically and physiologically and so forth and so on. And if we don't know what that looks like, we can't cultivate it. So again, we need that, so we design the performance. And then let's assume the students do the performance. What do we need now from them? We need them to analyze it and assess it. So we have to hook them. We have to model it. We have to get them to perform. Then we have to get them to assess the performance. Now, in my instruction, in all of my classes, I require writing for every class meeting. And I use the tactic that if the writing isn't completed, you're not allowed to remain in the class. And I go around and check. I have everyone take their paper out. And I go around, and I stamp the papers to make sure that they don't later substitute a paper for the paper that they have in front of them. And if they haven't done it, I say, your ticket is not here. Here's your assignment for today. Go to the library and do the assignment that you were supposed to do before you came in here. Of course, some students may say, but I paid to be here. 
And my answer is, you didn't pay to be here, you paid to get my instruction. And here's my instruction. Go to the library and do the assignment, because in class, we're going to build upon that. It's like somebody who doesn't understand the plans who's going to lay the foundation. No, you're, you're, you're going to be counterfeiting. Students who discuss a novel who haven't read a novel are violating the logic of the process. This should not be allowed. We have no obligation to allow it. But the main point is, there is this performance. Now, the students come in and they have their papers. And periodically, I do the following. Let me have all the papers, pass them in. By the way, I use portfolios, so all the students have a portfolio of their performances. And I tell them that the portfolio should look like what they would submit to an employer in order to get a job. And if they would submit a portfolio to an employer with a lot of misspellings and crossings out and in a kind of sloppy form, then that's the way they should include their portfolio for me. But if for an employer, they would take pains to make it as presentable than they should. And I strongly recommend they use computers so that they can revise easily and so forth. Okay. So now I collect the papers for the, for the day. And I put, I say, assessment groups, groups of four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. I give them their papers, randomly distributed to the assessment groups. Then I say, OK, let's take this group. Give me one of your papers. I take one of the papers. I read the paper out loud in front of the class. And we do a collective analysis and assessment of the paper. The assessment of the paper has the following ground rules. The only thing you can say is, how could this paper be improved, and what exactly would need to be done to improve it? What is not allowed are general statements of like or dislike. No sweeping comments, beautiful paper, interesting paper, insightful paper. It doesn't help me in the least. It tells me how you reacted to it. What I want to know is how to improve it. And I don't want to see here on the other side terrible paper, stupid paper, or anything of that, of that nature. So here's a comment you might make. In the first paragraph, as I understand the assignment, we were to clarify the question. Well, in the paper that you're reading, I don't get the question from the first paragraph. I need some further elaboration on what the question is asking. Then we turn to the person who wrote it. Does that make sense to you? Uh-huh, OK. That's one way you could improve it. We go through improvement, 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 suggestions for improvement. These go back to the author, and the author has the opportunity to revise it in their portfolio, first draft, second draft. And then I say, OK, now assess the papers in assessment teams just as we assessed this one paper. The assessment teams go through. They number their suggestions for improvement. They put them in the margin, and they sign off on it. Now, if I happen to pick that paper to assess, I assess the assessment as well. And assessment teams that don't do a good job should expect that I notice the deficiency in their reasoning. And that's part of what I certainly will include in my grade. Secondly, when the assessment goes back to the author, the author may want to challenge part of the assessment. If so, they have their choice. They can either incorporate the suggestion for improvement, or they can explain with reasoning why they think it's not necessary. Their choice, whichever they think. Now, what happens is that the students get pretty good at assessing papers. And in fact, they can do a much better job of assessing the papers than I can, because I don't have the time to go through with that detail and give all these suggestions for improvement. I just don't have the time. It's impossible. Couldn't be done, even if I was a saint, which I'm not. And so they get much better feedback. It is meaningful feedback. And they're engaged in improvement, and they're engaged in self-reflective reasoning, and they're understanding what the performance involves, and so forth and so on. And so they do the performance, and by and large, they analyze and assess the performances in the majority of cases. I don't give a grade until the final grade is due. Other than that, I give no grades. But I do give back the same thing, feedback. 
feedback on the papers that I comment on, and of course invite them to uh, uh, to do their own assessment. And they have the option at the end of the semester, if they don't like the final grade that they received, to challenge that grade. And I will do the following. I will raise the grade, or I'll keep it the same, or I'll lower it, depending on my new assessment. Because, of course, if you want justice, justice is blind. You want a new assessment. We may decide it was worse than it seemed first time around by going over it a second time. This reduces the challenges no end. <laughs> because though the students are demanding justice, it is not justice they want. They want a higher grade. Uh, and justice is blind. And that's, of course, just a little tactic which I use. Secondly, if they want more feedback, they can submit their portfolio at any time and request it. I'd like a little reason as to why you don't think your fellow student assessments are helping you in which case I'm, I'm happy to give that. But though I invite the students to do that, not many of them do. Most of them come to respect the assessment of their peers and to profit from that assessment. And so what I'm saying is that we can, if we want, teach as coaches. We can treat our subject as grounded in professional performances using reasoning, because any subject that doesn't use reasoning should not be offered for academic credit. It could be offered for something else, but not for academic credit. The community colleges in California, this is a requirement. And if the faculty who teach the course cannot explain how reasoning is involved, it becomes a non-credit course. And this is true of education in general. Reasoning is a part of what we're trying to get our students to do. It's an essential part. It's what defines the content. It's what defines the professional performance. But we have got to understand that ourselves. We have to understand the logic of our own subject. And we have to understand the logic of reasoning and the way they intersect. And then we have to design the process so that student reasoning is used to produce the performance that masters the content. And you can do this in any area at virtually any level. The Philosophy for Children program, which begins at the, I think it is now the first grade level, presents to children of six and seven abstract philosophical problems, like what is knowledge? What is a mind? How can minds think? How is it that your mind can know something that isn't mental, like a dog? A dog is physical. Your mind is mental. How can the mind know a dog? And these questions are asked of six and seven-year-olds, and they reason about them. And the Institute for the Advancement of Philosophy for Children have reams and reams of tapes of little children reasoning about abstract questions and they don't have any trouble reasoning about them. It is only adult prejudice and the failure of adults to ask questions in a stimulating context that children do not engage in reasoning. Reasoning is very natural to children. This is one reason why they say to our consternation, why, why, why? And it's only when they get our didactic answers, this is why, that's why, this is why, that's why, that their questioning is killed, becomes dormant, and they begin to move into the habit and the nature of passivity, which defines the student today. And so if the, if the basic model is clear as to what we're trying to teach, what the performance is, and we model the performance and model the assessment, design the performance and have the students design participate in the design and application of the assessment. And we do it again and again and again through the course, working on this content and that content and that content, helping them to see the whole and using the whole in the parts, 
which is, by the way, another mistake that we make. Present the whole in the beginning and then forget it, never mention it again. This is the textbook strategy. Introduction to sociological thinking. First chapter tells you what sociology is about, globally speaking, and you never again discuss it ever again. You now go into part, 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 more and more about less and less. Uh, but yet the whole organizes the part, and the part must be understood in terms of the whole. So here is the strategy for teaching your subject critically with respect to this, from the whole to the parts, from the parts to the whole, up and back, up and back. So now, after six assignments in historical reasoning, what do you now think historical reasoning is all about? The very question you start with, and on the final exam, describe historical reasoning, give us its characteristics as you understand it, support it by references to your various performances in historical reasoning, and then, by the way, here's a question calling for another historical performance, and you engage in it. It can be done, ladies and gentlemen. We can get students to assess their own work. And here's the beauty of it. The more we do it, the less we have to do. And furthermore, it's good for them. It is not evading our responsibility. It is fulfilling our responsibility. So be a good coach and remove a heavy burden from yourself. Take the ball which they toss to you and toss it back to them. And every time they throw it to you, throw it back to them. But of course, in a way that illuminates the nature of the game. Thank you very much.